too. All right, cool. Thank you for that. I think uh, Shoreside will be really appreciative of this, hopefully. Okay. Be able to do some reconstructions of it. That would be great. Be so neat. It does look like it was all connected once. There's yeah. just like this trail in between. Oh, can you imagine? Oh my gosh. I think there is actually different sponges settling. Like this is different sponge than this. So yeah. you end up with multi-species sponge assemblage. Can we zoom maybe right here on this sea star? Go for zoom. Got a couple of different sea stars here. Um, this sponge matrix uh, creates a very interesting uh, habitat for invertebrates that might be predated upon by these predators, like this uh, possibly Henricia star here, or if this is Pythonaster, I'm not quite sure. It's a little bit further away. But zoom more? That's all I got. Actually, oh, okay. just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> Such a trickster. <laughs> <laughs> it's too early for that. That's all I got now. Okay. Looks a little bit more like Henricia to me. Okay. And then okay, just to the upper left, in front of the large sponge in the back, there's a red sea star. If we can do like a half zoom on that, just oh, to see yeah. if it's an ophiroid or an asteroid. Go for zoom. That's a brittle star. Okay, go okay. away. Yep. All right, and then uh, I think, let's see, there were a few squat lobsters on top of this frilly sponge somewhere up here. Okay. Or maybe on the back side, whichever one might be easiest to image. Yeah, there's one right there. Oh, that's a nice shot with the cinema cam. Yeah, so th there's multiple of these Munidopsis crabs all over. We have a bunch of squat lobsters in our suction uh, system already in our suction uh, jars. So I'm going to review before sampling any more if there's any uh, if there's any uh, rationale to collect any of these. But I think we'll, we can move on after we image this and uh, keep moving up this steep scarp. Okay, go away. And we are going to be on the lookout for some rocks, but um, we'll just keep our eyes open for now. Doesn't look like a very good rock area, but we'll look. Looks like a good sponge area. <laughs> wow. So, plenty of Munidopsis on this sponge, um, so squat lobsters, and then what kind of sponge go for zoom video? did you say this was? Just go far in. This is probably local oh. calyx. Just sort of drift over it. Yeah. All right. And, um, if we could turn lasers back on at your convenience. <laughs> All right, very nice. So yeah, we got a good shot with the lasers in the um, cinema cam that should be able allow us to size it. It's this bigger portion is definitely in excess of a meter, maybe even close to two meters in, in width, and maybe at least a meter in height. So nice voluminous sponge. Some folks on the chat are wondering, what do you think this sponge might feel like if you were to reach out and touch and grab it? What, the, what would the texture be? Um, Probably very brittle, yeah. Wow, it doesn't look brittle. It looks so pillowy and soft and... Looks squishy. Yeah, yeah it looks squishy. It would be uh, definitely the, the brittle, crunchy, um, not like brittle like fractures into a thousand pieces, but like it'll tear easily, kind of in flakes, but those flakes will be crunchy. Mm. Crunchy, teary flakes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay.
because this is a glass sponge, right? So you can kind of imagine like fiberglass is kind of what it right. feels like. Right. Wow. That's a really light colored squat lobster. I just, I wonder what's like living within the folds that we can't see even. It's really, really amazing. So the laser dots that we're using to measure are 10 centimeters apart to give you an idea. So just a moment ago, Steve was mentioning that he estimates that this, um, sponge is about two meters across and at least one meter high. Yep. Steve, anything else you want to see here? Do you want zooms of the backside? Nope, we're, we can move on. Okay, sounds good. Beautiful. It's wonderful flying, Gabby. Yeah, Thanks. very good job. Uh, 12 to 4 set me up with <laughs> a vehicle that was like perfectly trimmed and <laughs> working well. And How kind it's, of fun. Yeah, that was, it's flying really well right now. And in the perfect location. <laughs> Thank you, 12 to 4. Yeah, that is, that is see as, that. As <laughs> <laughs> that's as well as it's flown so far for me. And we got the current on our nose, or how's it flowing around this area? A little bit, like maybe um, from like my two o'clock, from Herc's like two o'clock towards yeah. the vehicle, but from the east, uh, it's pretty light. Okay, uh, where are we headed to? Great question. Um, let's aim for... Zero nine five. It is really flying so well right now. Nice change. Okay, ready for a move? Yeah. Bridge now. Good morning, uh, five zero meter zero nine five, please. Our online viewers are asking, uh, you know, theoretical sub, uh, question. They're wondering how many squat lobsters could potentially live in a sponge that size. Um, well, I counted at least six. So, at least six. Zero nine. <laughs> at least six, all right. It is something, you know, scientists can look at. We can look at, um, you know, the, the density of the squat lobsters, you know, the, the habitats are uh, such that, you know, only a certain number of species can inhabit an area before they become competitive and then overcompete for resources. So it's definitely something that uh, is an ecological pattern that we need to better characterize and observe. And that's something we can do with the imagery that we've collected. Awesome bamboo coral garden here. It makes sense it's on the eastern side of this ridge too. That seems where the current's coming up and over this uh, promontory. This coral looks so shrub-like to me. It's almost like I, I almost forget that it's underwater at some points. Yeah.
Yeah. Doesn't. Uh, so a sponge like that, Steve, can you imagine like how old it might be? I've heard that sponges are some of the oldest lived creatures on the planet. Yeah, I, I would say that that's true. Um, it's really difficult to tell. Silica is very difficult to date um, compared to things like calcium carbonate. It is possible, but there's a larger um, margin of error around the, the absolute values of the age. So it's not quite sure, but I, it's probably on the order of at least hundreds of years old. Oh, really? So it's really fast growing then? Uh, I'll say that's a minimum. Okay. Yeah. It could be thousands, but... I was just reading reading the news article about the, the minivan-sized sponge. Uh, it was called the Volkswagen bus sponge uh, from... <laughs> was um, it the same same species? It, it, it does look like the same Go species. Through. Slight differences, perhaps. Um, but it says uh, they can be suspected to live up to 2,300 years. Um, this actually might be a good comparison for Daniel because he was on the... Uh, expedition that found that sponge um, so I'm sure he can provide some context oh so correction it was uh, found in Papahana Mokokea Marine National Excellent. Monument. Although I do believe that the musician seamounts also had some fairly impressive sponge communities, and it wouldn't surprise me if the distribution could, was contiguous amongst those three areas. We do, um, you know, the, all of these areas, while they're geopolitically distinct from each other, separated by international waters, they really have similar uh, species assemblages, and uh, we would call this like a biogeographic province or an area where similar s groups of species reside at similar depths, for example. So it's totally reasonable and expected to see the same species, uh, even rare ones, across thousands and thousands of miles of distance. This is a neat spot. I mean, I wonder what other, like, the ridge goes on for a ways here. Yeah. We might find some other giant stuff. I see these, there's a bunch of really giant sponges coming up. Yeah, you, you could dedicate a dive just to collecting species of bamboo corals down here because they're just different enough, it's really difficult to, to tease them apart. Do you ever find species that are completely geographically isolated to like one seamount? Um, yeah. The, uh, there has been a hypothesis for a long time that seamounts might have um, these kind of uh, unique species, but I don't think there's much data to support that uh, hypothesis. Okay. Uh, we call those species endemic uh, if they're only found in a certain area, but most of the time endemic species are just species that have been sampled or collected uh, and may have been seen elsewhere, but they haven't been identified from material, so it's kind of like a, it's an unclear distribution. Um, but I, I don't think, with a couple of exceptions in here in the Central Pacific, that there's a lot of endemism. But that said, the degree of connectivity between one seamount and another is, um, is really poorly known because these population genetic studies really take a lot of uh, sampling, intensive sampling, and and uh, resources, you know, funding to to do uh, pretty well. Wow, this is quite so a <laughs> so <laughs> dense. Gosh, and all of this is bamboo coral, right? It's a little forest, or at least the vast majority of it. Yep. Go for Zoom video? It almost looks like, uh, reminds me of an eelgrass garden or something. Mm, totally. Incredibly dense. 
So somebody asked a while ago in the chat, are the coral we're seeing right now dead? And No, these are all very alive and very healthy. Yeah. They're actually living their best life. <laughs> Thriving. Thriving, Thriving. flourished. Being all thirsty. Yep. Moisturized. Moisturized. <laughs> Moisturized. Drinking water. <laughs> um, uh, it's quiet. Yeah, what is that? Yeah, so these are caratoicidids. Um, the polyps are all on one side of the branch, which tells us a little bit of something about uh, how, well, you know, what group of uh, corals can they I could get belong the porch to. Up? Oh, actually, I can just do this. There we go. There's a squat lobster. 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 Okay, go away. Very cool. My goodness. So as Steve mentioned, the coral that we're seeing is definitely thriving uh, right here. Occasionally we might see some uh, sponges, some sponge stalks that are no longer living and uh, kind of old and decrepit looking. But as uh, Steve mentioned before, they do have a different skeletal structure. And so it just takes a lot longer for those um, sponges once they passed away. It takes a lot longer for those to degrade. Bridge now. Uh, we can do another five zero meter, zero nine five. Like someone said it's a coral spa. It appears to be as a mm. hot spot for coral. That was so rad. Yeah. <laughs> it's been an awesome, yeah. awesome start to our shift so far. Thanks, 12 to 4. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry you had to suffer so much for that. <laughs> Hopefully they got to watch some of it downstairs. <laughs> yeah. Decompressing. Great question coming in. Are the corals at depth less susceptible to climate change? Uh, I, I would say no. Um, but there's been some really good experimental evidence to suggest that they are not um, uh, resilient to uh, kind of end century climate scenarios. Uh, and the, it's, you know, while we, we live in an environment down here or these corals live in an environment that is um, we call a stenotherm so these are stenothermic uh, animals they're only able to tolerate very small changes in temperature the the greater risk um, it seems to these ecosystems is uh, through other other mechanisms associated with uh, climate uh, and co2 emissions like um, ocean acidification um, deoxygenation of the oceans uh, in some ways, but eventually temperatures will change, but on a much lower scale down here because of just how the ocean waters circulate, thermohaline circulation. But in the experimental studies that have been conducted, uh, we find that these um, animals and these ecosystems are N not necessarily more resilient um, than shallow water environments. Are these fans we're seeing the Paragorgia or Hemicorallium? Yeah, so we have we have a bunch of things here. We have um, we have Calyptrophora, a Primoid in the foreground. Um, I'm looking in the in the um, cinema camera, so I'm just going to spout off a few names. We have one, two, at least two species of bamboo corals, Caratoicididae, and then we've got, yeah, that's a that's a Caratoicidid bamboo Go coral, what? and we've also got um, this star that this um, colony that's being predated upon is possibly Achenella uh, by the Hipposteria sea star, and then there's also a number of Chrysogorgia bottlebrush corals in the area as well with this uh, squat lobster. Associate. Cool. 
a lot of sponge uh, skeleton debris as well. Just past. Yeah, yeah. lots of it. Accumulating. So Steve, would you consider this to be a high uh, diversity area as well? Yeah, I think you could make that case. Are we still interested in NISCM samples on high diversity areas? Uh, yes, but we have three more left, so I'm going to reserve them for a little bit later. Right they, they took one on the lower end of the slope, ah, okay. um, and I wouldn't suspect that the That's an interesting community sponge. would change too much. There's, there's an Aritagorgia yeah, uh, in this area, too. There's an Esclade the pom -poms. Yeah. In the, over here. There's a yellow fan. Can we take a look at this? Go for zoom. I just want to see if this is a Lampids or, or really an S-clade bamboo. Yep, it's an S-clade, S1-clade uh, bamboo coral. Oh. We have collected <laughs> these. Photobombing. <laughs> We've collected these on other sites, um, so just some good imagery to document it. And Steve, to what you're saying about deep sea corals being not necessarily resilient, is that possibly because, like, whereas maybe corals in the surface ocean can deal with a larger change in temperature, these ones, because we've only really been, like, 1.9 to 2.1 degrees Celsius most of the time. Yeah, that's the idea. I mean, uh, these, these animals are evolutionarily adapted to this okay? very st relatively okay. stable okay. temperature regime. And so any deviation from that uh, can result in stress. And so um, the, the effect is really magnified as you get towards the higher latitudes you know, in the deep sea. So things that in the deep sea at higher latitudes will be even less resilient, um, which is where most of the climate impacts uh, start and, um, and have the most notable effects. This is the Ritigorgia magnus borealis here. I love these. Steve, it seems like some of the magnus borealis have really long uh, fronds and some very short. Are those still the same species? It seems so. I mean, the, it's, okay, it's tough on. to tell um, without sampling anything, but um, the big diagnostic characteristic we use for differentiating genera on the seafloor uh, is the, the helix coil distance, the distance, it, um, the linear distance between parts of the, of the helix. Can you, can you explain that again? Yep. So, here, let me see if I can do this. So if this is your coral colony, <laughs> right? <laughs> Thank I you. love okay. that. Then the, the distance between one of those coils like that, that's yeah. your that's your uh, your test. That's the characteristic that determines species? It, it helps, too. It's wow. not the only. Wow. Interesting. <laughs> For example, some are, some are wound really tight. Right. right like this. That's going to be probably a different species than... And if you take this to its, you know, extend the logic a little bit and extend the colony and like pull it apart like a slinky, you kind of get this wavy effect. Uh, and the waviness is actually a totally different genus uh, from what we can tell, which is both morphologically and genetically dissimilar from Aritagorgia. Huh. And that's called uh, Rodan Aritagorgia. Interesting. Thank you. Bridge now. Uh, let's add another five zero meters, or actually, new move, five zero meters, uh, zero nine zero. We'll just do east up the ridge here. So this is an interesting question, I think. Um, like, uh, somebody's wondering if we collect any of the dead sponges, would any of that be helpful for anything? Ridge. I see that now. Uh, dead sponges. That's we have collected them fine. in the past, yeah. um, but it's not yeah, really it. been requested by our scientists ashore, so we're not necessarily as interested uh, in those, particularly if they're not manganese-coated. Um, 
they do contain a lot of really interesting associated invertebrate fauna, but it's not something we haven't collected in the past. So we'll we'll just make note of what's on there and then um, observe them. Yeah, maybe our next move goes back to zero eight zero. What's that? Our next move can be zero eight zero. We can just okay. do a little zigzag. Can we take a closer zoom on that? Yep. Go for zoom. Okay. That this is a primnoid octocoral, very close relative of the bamboos, but lacks nodes uh, and has a very different polyp structure. Go away. So oftentimes when people think of coral or coral reefs, they imagine like very beautiful, vivid colors. And we're seeing lots and lots of coral down here, but our viewers are noticing that they're definitely on the pale side and lacking a lot of color. And Steve, I know a few nights ago you explained that it's pretty expensive for pigmentation to occur at these depths. And so is that the same story with why these coral are so colorless, generally speaking? Yeah, yes. Uh, yeah, for the most part, you know, th there are a couple groups that have really evolved and radiated, um, you know, really well, adapted really well to the deep sea environment. And those are the chrysogorgids, the golden corals, the primnoids, and the bamboo corals. And most of them have a common theme that they're either very lightly pigmented or non-pigmented. Um, so it, it has to serve a function. Uh, otherwise, it wouldn't have been selected for. Um, Meanwhile, other species perhaps that come from shallower waters and you know, maybe radiated in the shallower waters and then invaded the deep sea evolutionarily over time might retain some of the characteristics of their shallow water relatives. Mm. Yeah, so something about having a lack of pigment at these depths is beneficial to the coral. And I'm guessing that there is some work being done to study exactly why that might be. I wish, but <laughs> I, 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 can't, I can't point you to someone who's actually doing that work. So if someone out there wants yeah. to <laughs> take up that question, I know it would be really, really useful because everyone's been wondering that for probably years and decades. Yeah, that was a really, really good question, good observation. And another question about the lifespan of coral. Do we have an estimate of the species that we're seeing down here ab about how old they could live up to? Um, it, it's it's not impossible to, to say uh, hundreds of years. I think hundreds of years is, is probably the, the baseline for some of the larger colonies. And it could even go up to a thousand plus years, depending on which species and how large they are. For stony corals, we, we have good dates from the line islands, uh, a 10 or 15 centimeter tall Enolopsemia colony. Front row, can we take a look and see if there's any loose rocks in this area? Medium sized. There's taters. Just one bigger than that. Oh, ready for a grab and go. Yeah. Is that, a, uh -huh. is that okay? Yeah. Uh, do you want a sample here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, let's do it. Get a let's grab while we can. How's that one looking? I've put you too far away, one second. Great shot in the, uh, yeah, tripods, tripods. Yeah, again, that cinema cam that we have is just 
pure magic. Okay. It's Try really that. nice. Yeah, I think so. That might work. This rock looks pretty round. Down like coming up. Yeah. Can't be choosy. Can't be choosy when <laughs> there's not a lot of loose rocks. <laughs> Where is this going? Starboard bow box A, <clears throat> most forward. This is 182. 182, thank you. Yep. Are you full wide video? I am. Okay. Thank you. No, 182. Oh. Sorry. Karen. I, I don't know if you're re repeat, repeating that, Karen. Oh. <laughs> Yep, so most forward, small box. Um, Nick, uh, size? I would say about 15 centimeters, um, sub-rounded. Sub Maybe sub-rounded. Maybe rounded. I, you know, I could see you know it, though. What? I got it. You know what I mean? I, d I, know, I know what you mean. I'm starting to. Just slightly so we, below okay. rounded. Did I miss this conversation earlier about sub-rounded and sub-angular? Does this mean that it's... Possibly. Under-rounded? under, -rounded? under instead, of like, <laughs> instead of being like expansively rounded, <laughs> slightly under-rounded. Yeah. I mean, think of a continuous, you know, Sphere. classification scheme between angular and rounded, and then somewhere in between is sub-angular and sub-rounded. And I don't know what you would call a rock in between sub-angular and sub-rounded. I would just say rock. Rock. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Read my mind. Roger. So, I'll chew on that one. Yeah, Nick, you are out here looking for angular rocks, right? So that, as Samantha pointed out, was a bit more on the rounded yeah. side than what you would usually be looking for. Um, so Subrounded. We're looking Sub for rocks uh, generally, but okay. you know, uh, if if we could choose our rocks, then we would choose the best rocks. But um, you know, when they're sparse like this, sometimes you just have to pick what's loose and, and available. If you can describe your perfect rock. <laughs> <laughs> Are we going to go there this morning? Are we going to go? Bachelor number one. Yeah. <laughs> if you could describe it, what would it, what would it be like? Very dateable. <laughs> Very dateable. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, are we going to go there this morning? Apparently we are. Uh, yeah, we're going there. Uh, it's something that has a lot of plagic lace. And plagic lace is, is very easy mineral to date in basalts. If we were dealing with, uh, you know, continental rocks, I'd say something like a sanidine. Um, we, use a, we use a standard called Fish Canyon Tough. Came from an eruption in Colorado and it's abundant and we use that to kind of standardize uh, geochronological measurements. Uh, and sanidine is just a, another one of those minerals that um, are, are easily, easily can you easily find dates from. Okay, so you're looking for a rock that is just gonna be clear as day pretty much about how old it is. <laughs> <laughs> Very upfront about its age. Uh, you had to turn his microphone off for that one. I don't, I know, if, I don't know if they're up front. <laughs> it takes a lot of digging, a lot of, a lot of sieving. Yeah, there's a lot of work to be done to get to there that is point. There is a That's lot true. of crushing. Yes. Yeah, let's not go downhill. Um, well, the ship just finished her move, so let's go uphill. How about... <laughs> uh, how about we do 080? 070? Correct, more north, yeah. So we're on the southern slope. 07? Great, let's do it. Bridge, I'd say yeah. some of the most interesting rocks that we found, though, are ones that I don't think that we, we can get dates on. Uh, uh, five zero meters, Samantha's zero seven rock zero yesterday zero was really, really strange. Yeah. Uh, she had a moment with it. I oh, yes. <laughs> yes. She did. With uh, the rock that you cut? The hard rock? Oh, the green yeah. rock. The, the, the hard one, the yes. The green tinted rock. With oh, no, that wasn't mine. But oh, that was uh, yours. But you did have a moment with that rock. I had a moment with the rock, correct. Yeah. Uh, I, I did not know that. 
Yeah, we had, yeah, it was so. Really <laughs> it was a really strange rock. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we collect these rocks. Um, we get these rock samples and bring them up onto the ship where there is a rock cutter. And yesterday there was a line of people just waiting to cut rocks with Nick. Yeah. And it was. And you were one of them? I was one of them. It was yeah. so much fun. I cut two rocks. The first one. Um, you cut a pretty big one, too, if I remember. Yeah, I think that one was useless in terms of dating, so not a compatible Brutal. match. Brutal. The second one also was useless, but it was really pretty. Which one was that? One the of the... One with the olivine in it. Mm. Um, yeah. Was that the green one? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. That's what the one I was, was, was talking about. Like yeah. Blue corals. Yeah. It was just really amazing to look at. Uh, and then we have a couple of Great, thank a couple you. of primnoid fans, and uh, <laughs> chrysogorgids are fairly common as well. It seems like there's three or four on every rock, rocky outcrop. There's a comment that says, likes rocks or dates rocks, get you a man who does both. <laughs> so. uh, that's good. This is interesting. Um, as we swing around this sponge, can we look at it from the other side? Uh, we can try. In passing is fine. We don't need to linger. Just kind of get a glimpse of what it looks like on the other side. It looks like a kind of an aberrant growth of uh, Tritoplura. Could be a different species. Um, very large. No, but actually, you know what? This might even be something totally different. This sponge kind of reminds me of the uridid we saw a few days ago, but it has the texture of a Tritoplura. Very concave. Wow. Go for zoom. Stop there. Very thin, very fragile. Beautiful, thank you, Logan. Mm -hmm. Is that some good black coral in front of it there, to the left? Um, I don't see any black coral here. Mostly that one got with the branching, not just on the one side of the axis. Which where are we? Where are we looking? Uh, right to now, it's at the kind of the bottom right of this. There. Oops. Yep. No. no. Uh, that was a Chrysogorgia. This kind of bushy bottle brush thing. Okay, I'm gonna turn away here. Yeah, that, that is interesting to note. There is no black coral here. We saw some of it deeper, but um, these uh, Alcyonations are, are dominating the sea fans and, and their allies. Sea fans, sea pens. Sea pens uh, now fall under the Scler Alcyonacea group. They used to belong to a, a higher group. The more we sample and the more we sequence and the more uh, kinds of technologies we employ to kind of better identify and delineate patterns in the evolution of these organisms, the more we find that the relationships are different than what we originally expected based on morphological similarities or differences alone. That's really valuable. Oh, there's a precious coral right here, too. Honey Corellium. We don't have to zoom on it. It's, okay. it's known. Nope. Oh, the, the uh, that profile. Uh, let me take a look at it, but no. Okay. Uh, not really. It's, it's, it's okay two tenths uh, or four tenths. What's that? Oh, no, four one hundredths of a degree. I think that's normal. I'm just looking at this feature here. It's interesting. At what? At uh, this feature here? Yeah, it is cool. A little pillow. Oh, oh yeah. Let me take a look at that. No reading since uh, we came on shift on Grafana's. It could be. Um, oh no, it's updating. Let me 
Check well, here. The, yeah, the Grafana temp conductivity and salinity haven't updated since uh, we got on shift on Grafana. Have you refreshed the page? Yeah, I, we just did. We haven't had a. We haven't had a temperature, salinity, conductivity record since the top of the hour. So uh, go up at the top of the window, like still in the black part of the window. There's like the the place on the screen where it says which one you're looking at. Like mine says ROV pilot less, like which uh, Grafana you've selected. On the right hand side of that sort of bar, it'll say like last five minutes or last 15 minutes or whatever. Yeah, I, I'm looking at it. It's, okay. it's not yeah, and, reporting uh, anything. Just do go to the pull down menu yep. of last five minutes and set it to last five minutes if it isn't already. Yeah, it says no data points. Um, are you looking at the same uh, window as you were before? The same, I, whatever, ROV pilot less or whatever? Yeah, we're looking at side dive data, which is the same, same data. I'll switch to par ROV pilot plus to see if there's any... Uh, I'm seeing the same thing on mine, actually. Gabby, are you happy on this heading? Um, yeah, for now. Great. Continue for now. Would it help to cycle power on the CTD? Uh, Bridge, no? I do, is it just the CTD whose data is missing? Yeah, the O2's, O2 data is, is oh. good. You can add another 5 zero, uh, zero, zero, Let me check. Yeah. If you think it's actually the CTD, that's a different thing. Nope, CTD looks great. Hmm. Um, so, and okay, I can't get up to help right now and click around. Um. I'm clicking, but it, I actually see the same thing on my screen. Loading in Grafana, temperature, connectivity, salinity, all stop at 1400. Okay, but only data from that one sensor. Only so data from that one sensor. Okay. okay. That is definitely above my pay grade. Is that a Tim issue? What's that? Tim issue? That's a Tim issue, yeah. I did see Tim earlier. I Let can check if he's... Okay, yeah, go ahead. He's up at some very strange hours, but that might have been, that might have been the end of his day that you so saw him at. So on your, um, on your GUIs, do you have CTD data inputs? Or you just, just use Grafana? Um, I can see CTD data coming directly in from the vehicle. Okay. Like its first stop is here. So it's a grip on a thing then? Yeah. Okay, cool. Exactly. Okay, so we're still correct collecting data. It's yes, just, uh, we definitely are. That's, that's okay. Yeah, I think Tim is finally asleep, which is good. <laughs> So there are some very good questions coming in on the chat. Um, so someone's wondering, would it be a good idea to sink some dead wood to the seafloor to offer uh, for these weird plants that we're seeing? So we're actually not seeing any plants at all. Um, there are, as far as we know, um, no plants that can live in the deep sea because there's no sunlight for them. Um, it's completely dark. The only way that we're able to see what we're seeing right now is because our ROV Hercules is equipped with lots of flashlights. Um, so what we're seeing down here are, at least with our naked eye, we're able to see uh, lots of different types of coral as well as sponge species. And these uh, do not photosynthesize, so they don't need any light in order for that to happen. And I don't know if they would necessarily benefit from having wood down here um, joining them. Really, really good question, though. Although we did pick up some wood that had, it's, co it's like called wood fall, when it, like a whale fall sank, sank to the bottom. So it does happen. And we are going to see what's on it. I guess there are some gastropods that were able to be seen when it was collected. That was collected on this dive product? Uh, yep. Oh, cool. 
Yeah, very cool. Oh, and nice. What's, uh, can we look at this frilly bits down here? Yeah. I think this might be sponge. Uh oh, like the one from last night? Yeah. It's so maybe not so rare. Um, the genus name on this is Stelodorix. And uh, interestingly, it was only observed at Johnson Atoll previously on uh, Okeanos Explorer cruises that have been through this area, but never collected. Is this a potential collection? No, we got one. Uh, okay. This was the thing we were looking at at the last watch that we... Um, yeah. Did that they get that one? They did. It's an uh, imposter, uh, imposter coral. Sponge pretending to be a coral. That's so cool. Imposter coral. Imposter coral. That's Can't be right. trusted. What, what was that? Sorry. Sorry, that was me poorly muting myself. No, you're good. No, it's Logan said it can't be trusted because it can't be trusted. Fake, oh. coral. Fake, Fake news. <laughs> what do you do with the useless, undateable rocks? Give them just as much love. Oh, <laughs> yes. So they might be useless to Nick, right? But there are lots of other geologists who would love to have a good time with those rocks, right? So Nick, I asked you a similar question yesterday. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we send them back to the repository to live out their long and lonely lives <laughs> on a shelf. <laughs> so <laughs> sad. <laughs> sad. Brutal. Uh, well, there are scientists I know for sure that um, study the ferromanganese crusts. Um, their economic viability as well as their uh, chemistry and how it relates to the other uh, the ocean currents. Um, besides that, I'm sure uh, some of the other sedimentary rocks and volcanic plastics are of particular interest to certain groups, maybe USGS. Um, but yeah, like you said, um, all rocks are good rocks, really, at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, just not for dating. <laughs> But someone may request them one day yes. from the archives. <laughs> They'll find their, their niche. Nice. Okay, so what we have here is uh, bamboo coral, Corrado Isididae. This one is, um, let's see, looks like node branching. Coral cheat sheet out, out again for clades. Wait, Steve uses cheat sheets? Oh, you think I know all of this in my head? <laughs> sure, sounds Seems like, like it. it. Yeah. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I would believe that in a heartbeat. This dive is having me question everything now. Oh. Oh my gosh. I just imagine that you have like the mind palace thing going on. Where you <laughs> can, like navigate just going down into the hallways of yeah. <laughs> all gonna, your coral. I'm gonna knowledge. call that one a, a J clade. Uh, nodal brancher, reminiscent of Jason Isis, but could be a different genus. We don't really have a lot of good um, genera names or a lot of different bamboo coral. Uh, morphologies, but J. clade is reminiscent of uh, Jason Isis, the typical genus for that group. Go for zoom. But it could also be an, an I. clade, but the problem is we'd have to collect it and look more closely at the sclerites and the polyp structure. But based it's on the colony there. morphology, it's suggestive of the suggestive of the, the J. clade. Okay. This one Go wide. could be similar. It could be different. Tough to tell when they're small like that. So I thought that clades were a different way of classifying things than like the typical like Linnaean setup. Yeah, clades are kind of um, ranks that we use to designate groups of things that doesn't have a traditional taxonomic rank. Um, so if we notice similarities amongst uh, 
groups of species, either genetically or morphologically, we might assign a clade name Copy zoom. Um, that that provides some um, some similarities for that. What is that? Can we get closer on that? Yeah. Like really close. Uh, okay, go ahead. Maybe sit down in front of it. Ship just is just finishing a move. Okay. Yeah, we still would there. need to go quick if we wanted to sample it. It looks like a bamboo it's or a, a hemi hemicorallium with all the branches broken off, but I really want to get a good look at that because it has a very um, unusual branching structure. I'll hold on and move just in case. I should be able to get go you a, a decision in the next couple of seconds if we can zoom. Okay, great. Yeah, I can see you counting over there, geologist. <laughs> <laughs> 12 okay. seconds is up. Yeah, so this <laughs> is a hemicura. Uh, oh, yuck. Um, I think it's a hemicorallium. Can we go down to the base? <laughs> Down, <Aww>. in <laughs> Down in front. Down in front. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with Coralia Day. It's just uh, missing a lot of branches, possibly regrowing. Um, because there's a, a hemicorellium just off to the left over there, I'm going to say this one is just one that was probably broken off the branches and uh, is in regrowth mode. So no sample. No sample. Got it. Keep it moving. Bridge now. Uh, five zero meters, zero seven zero. Some of our viewers are wondering if we are broadcasting from the ship or offshore. We are on the ship. Sure are. <laughs> and we have been on the ship for <laughs> quite some time. Sure have. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Having a great time, really, really, truly, honestly. Um, so we got sure on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I really am. <laughs> it just kept working. <laughs> um, we got on July 31st. We set sail August 2nd, and our um, expedition is coming to an end in just a few days. August 29th is when we're getting back to port in Honolulu. And then the next group is coming on to go um, do some exploration around Papahanao Mokuakea. So we are broadcasting live from the ship. Everything that you're seeing on your screen is happening live uh, several thousand meters below us. So this is what the colony should look like. I believe this is a hemicorallium species with a a Steroschema, probably, Riddle Star, family Uriellidae. What about the coral behind it? Yeah, I was looking at the white one that didn't branch, like, in a planar way. That it's one right there? Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's Echinella wibberi. That's pretty easy to spot. It branches um, either uh, trichotomously or tetrachotomously at the base, so three or four branches from one node okay. or branch point. It's got kind of like an apple tree sort of set up to it. Yeah. Oh yeah, I like it's that. Very, it, once you see that, uh, it also only has polyps on one side of the branches. It's one of the easiest corals to spot, and it can grow in very high densities. Tetracotomously, is that what you said? Four from uh, one yeah. node, maybe? Yeah. Yeah, so that, that counts as like one sample. So we have three open bottles. I've never heard of it. Can you say like pentacotomously? Can you keep going? Hexacotomously? Yeah. Septicotomously? Don't get crazy now. Octocotomously? <laughs> <laughs> Don't get crazy. Monocotomously? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so our viewers want to know if there's a place where they can see the live chat. Uh, no, so I, I'm, I'm appreciative that you want to be able to look to see if there's already been a question that's been answered, but um, we are the only ones that can be able to see those questions coming in. And again, we're trying our best to get to those as they come. Mm 
the largest animal that we have seen on our exploration. Ooh. Um, that sponge. I that's know that sponge. Yeah, if we whined about. Uh, I Humongous. That. So I think that's mm. definitely a contender. An hour. -ish. If we rewind an hour. You want to see that? Yeah. What time is it? Yeah. So about an hour ago. I'm really impressed at how much rubble there is at this site. Can we uh, zoom on kind of this debris field and just get a sense of what's oh, yeah. what kind of rubble and what the diversity of makeup could be? It seems to be mostly sponge rubble since that's the stuff that sticks around the longest. Go for zoom. It's like a talus field of sponge. Yeah. Yeah. Bradwin, do we have a 183 sample yet? Yeah, so mostly sponge rubble. No. Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay, go in. Does anyone know why I would have dropped a target 15 minutes ago? <laughs> At the top of this ridge. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Uh, was that when we were in the nugget field? Uh, did you ask me to drop a target? Were we ever no. in the nugget field? But I, I was mentally thinking it, so maybe... <laughs> Is that when we collected Nick's rock? 15 minutes ago? I think that was longer. No, that was, that was 182. <laughs> okay, we'll leave it there for now. Could have been a mistake. <laughs> it it probably, I think, th uh, wait, what time did it drop at? 15 minutes ago, 1442. Uh, yeah, that, I mean, that lines up when we reached waypoint. Uh, uh. No, it's <laughs> like over the sediment field with nodules. Okay. Uh, I, I marked that at 1456. Okay. So Great. You could change it to that. This whole uh, nav watch lead telepathy thing is kind of working out, I guess. Is it? Yeah. So we think that was the field? I think yeah. that was the module. Nugget field. Yeah. Nugget field, rather. There was a small depression in between the two ridges. Um, or ridge crests that seem to be more sediment sedimented. It's good to be a Chrysogorgia here. Yeah, are they all on that one side? Are we yeah, thinking the I'll current? How's the current? It's not strong. It is coming from the direction you'd expect given where they live. Like, it's coming from their side. So I heard that um, the slope capacity is kind of Hobbled from uh, the last watch. What's what's the status update from? Um, it's worth a try. The vehicle's behaving perfectly right now. So. Okay. I don't have anything to to do yeah. suction in the immediate area, but uh, good to know. Uh, they were definitely having some trouble with the hydraulics on the last watch, and it's not giving us trouble anymore. Okay. Um, but we'll have to try to know. Uh, no, uh, I just want to know what our capacity is. <laughs> Sounds like it's working just fine. I, yeah, no idea. Okay. Well, we can always test it. But there's nothing to suction here in this area, so keep going. It's a little sponge under the lasers. Oh yeah, a little tiny one. Go for zoom. A small bowl of summer. Okay, go on. So somebody was asking about whale fall. Um, how long would whale, a whale fall last at this depth? So a whale fall is when a whale um, passes away and then eventually its uh, carcass reaches the bottom of the ocean. It takes a while to get there, but it provides a huge quantity of food for any of the deep sea uh, organisms 
that would be living at this depth. So I would love to find the top of this ridge here. Um, it looks like uh, we haven't found it yet. As of nine minutes ago, the CTB is now reporting data again on Grafana. Oh, great. Seems strange. I think the bathymetry's off. I think it's actually oh. up here. It's yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. It's on our I know what I'm seeing, too. Around. Okay, we'll continue on 070 then. Yeah. Bridge now. So I believe that a whale fall would be down here for yeah, at least a couple of years. Um, we have seen a few whale falls, not on this expedition, but on previous ones. Where you were Can we look to uh, the left? taking a look closer yeah. to Monterey Bay, and uh, there was a whale fall that was discovered that was there for at least two what years. What are you thinking about, Steve? I just wanted to look up up slope, uh, or up to the left. Is there a ridge tracking linearly to our north? Is that it? Uh, yes, and we're trying to find it. Okay. We're yeah. um, we're sort of continuing to move towards it. Yeah. Slowly. I was think. Yeah. It. That, that's fine. We can move slowly. That would be nice to be up there, I think. Okay. Otherwise, the geologist might get some ideas back here. <laughs> <laughs> we would want that. Yeah. Although it has been an estimated 20 minutes. I, I mean, my, my no. dear colleague. <laughs> <laughs> it's been 170 meters since our last rock yeah. collection, which is getting pretty high up there. I think, Colder. I mean, we could just could just get some rocks. <laughs> that would solve that issue. You know, Steve? She's not I, wrong. I have no no objections. <laughs> this so is a strange thing. So you want to get this rock? Yeah. Get that. Yeah, that's a good one. Poor truck. <laughs> Poor truck. <laughs> Poor truck. <laughs> <laughs> Poor truck. <laughs> Poor nugget. I hope those cameras are important. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're finally working again. You want to keep it that way. Very pretty. Very. Was that a serious request for a rock? No, no. Okay. Um, a dream. I'll, I'll hold off for another 10, 15 minutes. Seems like the Chrysogorgia really like the lower flow environments that are kind of in the middle of this ridgy system. So on this rock we have um, probably two species of Chrysogorgia and then Stellodorix, the imposter sponge. Imposter sponge. Imposter sponge. Or to use a word from a few years ago, uh, Fakeagorgia. Fakeagorgia. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so sponges and coral are alive. They are animals, and uh, somebody in the chat wants to know if they are susceptible to diseases or bacterial infections. I know that at least shallow coral absolutely can get um, certain types of diseases, bacterial infections, I'm not completely sure, I would imagine, yes, but coral at depth and sponges at depth, would they be susceptible to that? Uh, we don't really know. Yeah. Can I see this for a second? Bamboo coral, okay. We're just starting to learn about kind of the microbiome of animals that, or the bacteria and viruses and things that inhabit the corals themselves. We don't really know what affects their health as much. Let's give it a whirl. TBD. And those types of, mode. you know, it, a lot of the research that's Bridge been going yeah. on has been really focused on continental margin communities, things that Can are much closer to shore. North? Out here, sampling is um, very poor uh, coverage, uh, bathymetrically and geographically. 
and we're still kind of in exploration mode for a lot of this deep sea ecosystem habitats uh, in the central Pacific region, the Pacific Remote Islands. That's a cool shot of that Arita Gorgia coming straight on to that yeah, spiral. Is that is that is that, a, that, a, is that it's is maybe that it's not a bamboo or a whip or something? Anyone like want to take a go and try and see <laughs> identify? I can't do it. It's, I don't think it's I an Arita Gorgia. I also though. don't think it's a Arita Gorgia. Go for zoom. I think maybe a bamboo of some kind. Oh. Yep, okay. you're right. Lifted basis? No. Bamboo. Yeah, so this is a this is this is a bamboo coral. You can see at the base of the colony the nodes that are present, but um, the kind of coil, you know, helix like morphology, growth growth uh, colony growth morphology is, is very common in the coral world because it serves a very specific function. Um, can we take a look at this in the back here? Yeah. Because I if you're if you're trying to maximize your energy uh, and particle capture potential, you really have a couple of choices. You have, you know, a fan shape or you have something that is long and coil shaped that allows you to slow down the water as it moves across your colony so it, it allows you to better capture part particles using very, very small structures like tentacles. So the Go coil resume. basically slows down water as water moves through it and uh, enhances particle capture. All right, so this is almost certainly a colony of Calyptrophora. It's, uh, I can write that in the chat. Uh, light right branching. Uh, usually gives that away first. Go away. Although, um, to be certain, we would have to look at the, the orientation, the polarity of the polyps, whether they're up or down axis. Um, and then we can also tell something from how articulated the polyps are, uh, you know, how many uh, plates might be present in the body wall, which could also further help us identify one genus or another, or even sometimes species. But usually genus is the best we can do. Is there um Oh, uh, never mind. It's something not... It's both behind us and to the... <laughs> it's like here. Yeah. I don't know. We sh we can We can find Maybe it. Maybe it's a saddle. Maybe. Can we look at this uh, kind of um, thing that goes like that? Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> question mark. Backwards question mark. Yeah. Sure. Go for zoom. What's the punctuation mark called with a question mark and an exclamation point? Yeah. Looks like. We're just looking at it from the wrong side. Yeah. <laughs> it's all about perspective. Okay, go wide. So there is a question. Um, are all the animals at depth carnivorous? Really good question. And I want to say yeah. I've otherwise, how else would they get their food? But Steve, correct me if I'm wrong. Not necessarily. We would say like heterotrophic. So they're getting their energy sources from other animals, other you know products of other animals. But uh, they're not all carnivorous. Uh, marine snow is not really a, you know an animal protein. That's true. It's probably primarily phytodetritus, you know, photosynthetic products. Uh, yeah, good point. But they, they, they may, you know, occasionally take small crustaceans perhaps, but more often than not, small amphipods and things like this are, um, you know, associates of the colony and live in and among the colony. And they may not be um, prey items, but perhaps beneficial. Samantha, can you zoom out on the scene uh, in high back real quick? Sorry. 
So again, that marine snow is what uh, Steve was mentioning just a moment ago, that white uh, particulate matter that you can see floating around in the water column. We call that marine snow. And that uh, is all kinds of stuff that drifts down from the surface all the way to the bottom. It may take years for it to reach this point, but it can absolutely be made out of um, animal matter, can be bacteria, plankton. I feel like the best description remains to be uh, ocean dandruff. dandruff. <laughs> yeah, ocean dandruff, <laughs> essentially. But yeah, all kinds of um, little sinkies that make their way all the, d all the way down eventually, including uh, phytoplankton, even though it may not be living anymore. So this is uh, this uh, Caratoisis barsa. This is something that um, is being worked on by some colleagues at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette uh, who have been looking at if some of these unbranched bamboo corals are actually truly unbranched or if they just branch very sparsely later in life or, or when. Uh, very interesting um, story with these sparsely branched bamboos. They've been collected quite a lot, but uh, we still are having trouble identifying and differentiating unbranched bamboos from perhaps uh, unbranched species in, in this area. There's a tremendous diversity. This is, uh, what is that? Candidella, Candidella helminthopthera. One of the most common primnoids throughout this area. So is there a such a thing as underwater storms or weather in the ocean? I would imagine the answer is yes, up to a certain depths. I don't know if we would really see so much disturbance at a depth like this, but. Yeah, ben benthic storms are a thing. Um, when you have, for example, um, loss of integrity in a slope, of a sedimented slope, um, usually you can have benthic storms, which are rapid downhill undersea landslides. Mm -hmm. um, of sediment, but you know there can also be you know geological you know in forces that initiate those things like uh, uh, earthquakes, things like that. It's probably not as frequent out here because there's not as much sedimentation right. in most of the rockier areas. But depends on what the slope this looks like. Uh, all right, front row, how do you feel about uh, a suction collection in the next uh, couple of minutes here? You yeah, sounds good. Um, so let me, I'll get out in front. What do you have in mind? I was thinking about one of these unbranched uh, colonies of coral. They're very abundant in this area. I'll circle it when, okay. when you have it. Yeah, second. the next one you see, just circle. Yeah. Are you thinking about uh, suction? Yeah, uh, we have to try it. Okay, because there Do are two samples already in the hose. And set up the next jar? Front row said we can try it. Okay, uh, try to, uh, yeah, if it flushes into the flush jar, that'd be cool, but there's two samples in the hose right now. Oh, FYI. okay. FYI, so. Okay, so uh, move the jar to, to, the, to red and run it for a little bit as we're going up slope here. Oh yeah, this does look like it's the ledge, right? Uh, I think it might be a little ledge. Uh, look in the Herc sonar, yeah, okay. it, it picks up on the other side. Little ledge. Yeah, little ledge. Oh yeah, that definitely was not a signal. And then maybe it goes down on the other side? I don't know. Okay, maybe. Okay, so the uh, there's a bunch of unbranched things here to differentiate it's gotta them be the first. Top. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is great. Really, really good placement. Great. <laughs> We're trying to find the top of this thing, but yeah, it's proven challenging. Okay, Steve, where do you want? All right, I'm trying to find the thing. I think it's this one back here. Okay. Um, 
able to run the slurp into the flush jar? Okay, and nothing came out, hey? That was a crinoid swimming okay. in the suction jar. Um, are you, Steve, are you willing to take a suction sample and sort of pile it on the other suction samples that are just sitting in the hose right now? Yeah, I mean, I if there okay. are, I think um, it's worth a, tr a try. It'll be small. Okay. Um, won't be bulky, so I'm hoping. So there's a lot of Chrysogorgia around here. I won't be able to set down, so this will be a flying grab. Sure. Yeah, we're looking for just a couple inches, maybe, of one of this um, this thing right here. You ready for a flying grab? I, I don't really think it's going to make it into a jar, but five, you can put it on five. It's worth a shot. We have a long, long way in the dive, and we've had a 100% success getting samples out of the tubes so far this cruise. Sounds great. Okay, so I think I'll just try and keep it as stable as possible and let you do all the moving, but we can we can switch that up if it doesn't work. So we're going for the reverse question mark here? Uh, yeah, can we get a zoom on it first before yeah. we go for, zoom. go for the snip? Uh, the ship has stopped, by the way. Uh, Thanks. So that's a negative on this one. This is a bamboo coral. It's not the right one. Okay, go wide. So we'll keep, keep going. Okay. Uh, Seems that those unbranched primnoids were restricted to that kind of less ritchy area, but this is still where we want to be. Yeah, do you want to take a look at anything else here for a potential sample? Uh, negative. Okay. Okay, so I let's let me go look let's over there. Uh, I was going to figure out what the strike of this yeah. is. So right now it kind of looks like it's looking at the Argus. Argus is, or Atalanta is pointed zero, 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 I think. Okay. Which would make the strike of the, of this like maybe zero nine five to one zero zero like just off of east yeah. west um, yeah if it is like right you're thinking it's right there yeah I think yeah. it's right there because there's nothing else in atalanta after that yeah yeah, yeah. and the big reflections are just going to be rocks and things yeah. like that Interesting. So what samples uh, would be in the slurp pose if we're... We'll try that next. Haven't seen them yet. A s white sponge with crinoid and a potential chrysoverger or hydroid with okay, a we'll squat lobster. There is a crinoid in, in one of the slurp jars, okay, so hold. maybe it did make it through. I saw it swimming in jar... Uh, two six jars back. Six or seven? <laughs> Yeah, so um. there is a crinoid that came through. I don't know, maybe the sponge didn't come through, but something can may be coming through. Can is we circle back to that jar and, and just see so I can write down the right uh, Yeah, one? we'll want to not pause on that jar because uh, the crinoid will escape. Okay. Just do, can we do like a quick turn yeah, we can just to do a the flush jar? So not that one, right, Steve? Nope. This one? Keep going. I saw that it as one? well. Yeah, it was definitely in there. <laughs> Okay. Dancing around. Spot lobster. There it is. Three. Yeah. Th three. Jar three. Well, three. Okay. It could have swam up the hose, too. I think we're giving the crinoid a little bit too much credit. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it could be accidental. It's most likely that it just got stuck somewhere and it dropped into the wrong bucket, but we can sort it out. Um, I think it's been a while since our last eDNA sample, or the last Niskin, and I think this might okay. be a good area that's Chrysogorgia dominated. Okay. To take another one on the fly is okay. If you're going to do that, it would be four. Yep. There's a pretty high density here. There's, you know, there's a good yeah. 10 colonies per square meter of 
mixed assemblage, but primarily Chrysogorgia, uh, bottle brush colonies, probably two species in this area. Um, this geniculata-like colony, you know, more consistent bottle brush morphology, and then this more sparse branching one, which could be um, dendritica or, or uh, something related. Excellent. So we're gonna sounds like take an eDNA sample using a Niskin bottle. Let me bottle. know if you want anything from the Zeus Cam. I'll just follow you over otherwise. And so when we say eDNA, that stands for environmental DNA. So as we collect this water sample, there is going to be um, a DNA profile within it that will allow um, scientists to kind of get a better idea of a general or a general idea of what um, organisms are living in this region, just based on their natural DNA that they're shedding, similar to how we shed skin cells and things like that. Oh, hold on one second, I am not retracted. Four. Somebody asked a while oh, ago yeah. gotcha. how many lumens are on the lights that we're using. Uh, there are 6,000 lumens. Okay, four. <laughs> and we're it's using yellow. about 15 flashlights. Okay. Uh, wait, did that push? Okay. <laughs> it's just the less gangly way. Would this area be considered a forest of life? There you go. That's very Thanks. beautiful. Uh, yeah, I think you could really make a case for a coral garden here. Yeah. Um, sometimes they're called marine animal forests, but uh, that's kind of more of a vague, um, you know, taxon in, uh, ex agnostic. Can we pan over a little bit to the left, or I don't know who has control of that. That's all we got. Yeah, that's our OV. That's all we got. Okay. If anybody is just joining us on yes. this there. live stream, nice welcome. Job. Yep, pop. Lovely. Four. This is the four to eight crew. We are exploring uh, Seamount in the northwestern region of Johnson Atoll. Now, can you drop Johnson a target Atoll. for the sample? And this is number... 183. 183. So our, uh, when we started off Roger. this dive, last night. Um, we were at a depth of about 2,500 meters and we have made our way on up to 1,943 meters. If you would like to see the, the altitude was three meters for that live data uh, from our ROV Hercules, you are able to do so by going to the main page, uh, going to nautiluslive.org. On the right hand side, there is a little sidebar where if you scroll down, it says more data. Click on that and then it can bring you up to a window where you can see the depth and temperature and uh, conductivity, all that stuff. So again, my name is Brittany. If you have any questions or comments that you would like to send our way, please go ahead and feel free to do that. I'm trying my best to keep up with everything that's coming on in the chat. We would love to hear from you. Okay, uh, science, anything else here? 
Uh, no, I think we can keep going, but I really like this um, this uh, ridge. I guess Great. we'll call it a ridge. I'm not sure if it's a ridge. Yeah, we're not sure either. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we're thinking... Uh, Zero nine zero. Okay. Bridge now. Uh, five zero meters, zero nine zero, please. Oh, we're getting a very sweet message in the chat. I genuinely enjoy watching the feed, and everyone there is very passionate. As a viewer, it sure feels like I'm right there with you all. Yeah, thanks for thank you for having us on. Um, we're glad that it feels like you're with us. And then we have a we have a question for the ROV pilots. So Gabby and Karen, when you get the chance, um, it's yeah, go a. Ahead. That's another video game question. So do you play a lot of video games? Um, are the controls intuitive for you or was it a difficult learning curve? <laughs> <laughs> this is a better Karen question. A better Karen question, okay. Karen, you're off uh, SPL, we can't hear you. So this is another one of those J. Clade Pareto ISIS. Thanks. Yeah, I think for sh certainly um, some ROVs you get with like the actual like the F-16 joystick to, to control the ROV. I think that's quite intuitive, especially if you've taken, um, if you've spent some time like on aviation simulators. Um, depending on what sort of gamer you are, are you a first person shooter? Um, I don't know how in depth you want to get with this question. It's, um, it's quite a great question. But um, yeah, I think the hand-eye coordination is, is really what is key um, is like the the skill that you that you take away from video games and can apply to your job. So, yeah, certainly, it's very intuitive. Um, I don't think I've ever flown an ROV with a with a joystick. Uh, is that like the majority of the ones you've worked on? Yeah, just like kind of like an F sixteen control, like. No kidding. Okay. <laughs> 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 That's awesome. I want to see those lasers. Yeah. <laughs> 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 cool. So where do ver where are verts on that? The verts are on your thumb. Oh, so it's all one hand. Yeah. So then you can do all your tooling and stuff with your left hand and just fly with your right hand. Okay. That's really neat. neat. That is really neat. Could probably even take a sip of your coffee occasionally. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of multitasking going on. <laughs> yeah, all the vehicles I've worked on are some some it version of this setup. Hmm. One hand for verts, whether it's trim or like a center returning joystick. Oh, okay. And then one hand for um, axials, laterals. And yeah. Mm. It's definitely a lot foggier up here, like cloudier, marine snow. Wonder if this is why we're having so much um, more benthic diversity or abundance for sure, perhaps diversity than any, than the other sites we've been on. Yeah, it could be. It reminds me of a lot of the. Um, the equatorial sites we had explored in previous years where there was much more marine snow because there was higher productivity in the water column. And it, there absolutely could be enhanced productivity around these oceanic islands uh, like Johnston. So that could be, it could be a proximity thing. Um, Go for zoom. Yeah, uh, I don't know school. that I've seen this yet. What is this? Yeah, oh. this is Rodan Aritagorgia. It's a new species. Um, it's Ooh. been collected many times, including earlier on this expedition. Cool. It's currently 
undergoing a description, I think, from okay, other colleagues in the field. And uh, I should follow up on that because we're seeing it quite often now. But there's certainly enough, a lot of material from those colonies. I had a really great screenshot of that from last year um, in our highlights. Let's see, I might kind of have it here. <laughs> While you're pulling that up, uh, we're getting a question about the lights that the ROV is using. So do the lights, do we maybe think that they uh, could potentially be repelling any animals from coming into the camera view? Um, or is, do we have any capability on the uh, ROV to use uh, like red light or black light or any other thing like that? Or is this it that we have? Uh, we're not set up right now for that. Uh, we have been in the past. Uh, I wish I knew more details. <laughs> I, I have used, on, like on camera slides, used red light to see if it attracts fewer krill. Um, there's definitely experimentation with that, but we're not set up for it. Um, there's uh, like hyperspectral imaging that's done where you don't need to supply like visual light. You can supply other wavelengths and take images at those wavelengths. Um, yeah, so we've been involved in a little of that, but right now we're just in like super simple mode where we're supplying visual light, visual spectrum, and uh, and our cameras detect at those wavelengths as well. Thanks, Gabby. Yeah, I actually have never thought about that before. Like, what would it be like if we were using a different... Uh, it's, it's not uncommon to have a camera that's like very sensitive in IR wavelengths down here, um, as well as visual wavelengths. Uh, and that can be helpful. Noah says that many fish at deep sea have many highly developed telescope eyes, very sensitive to the light. So it's a probable hypothesis that they stay away from Herc because of its lights. Yeah. So yeah, our ROV Hercules is uh, using, like I said, 15 uh, lamps that have a to have 6,000 lumens, so uh, quite bright <laughs> for some organisms that have potentially never seen light in their entire lives. Um, and then in addition, um, Hercules has uh, the motor, or how many, does he just, does Hercules just have the one motor, or how many? Uh, sorry, um, motor. Uh, does Hercules have one motor? Yes. Hercules has one electric motor, uh, I believe. Yes, that seems right. One electric motor um, and two, four, six thrusters. Awesome. Also, in terms of the red light question, red is the first light to disappear as you go deeper in the ocean. So I know there have been red lasers because I've seen those on like the NOAA guide. But in terms of like shining a red light, I don't know if you would be able to see that. I, I mean, that's the theory. If you use red light, you can see a little bit, but it doesn't carry far enough to deter critters or attract them in the case of krill. Mm, I see. Yeah, definitely. Red light's not going to go very far. Perk used to have red lasers, I think, way yeah, back when. Way yeah, back when. right when you started, I think it did. You know, 2013, 14 ish. Uh, yeah, I think the new ROV manager got on and was like, I bet green would be better. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're getting some students in North Carolina, hello, who want to know what is the favorite creature that we have seen so far or the coolest? Yeah, I'm happy. We're going down into like a little divot, and I think the ridge is going to continue to do that, like kind of go up and down. Yeah, so like, like up. I think I just have to be like committed to the zero nine zero and like have faith that it's going to work out. Okay. <laughs> so what do you think? Of, what do yeah. you think about this from a geological perspective? This landscape is is uh, that question about the geological landscape. Is there any interest in sampling? Uh, there might be as we nice. kind of go down this little slope here, um, hoping to see a little 
Talus debris field like we saw going up. Is this kind of hoping? Uh, the lasers looks. I don't know. I, you know, it looks like it's a little chewed up. I don't know if there's anything. It, it's still cohesive though. Uh, poke. It looks like we will go back up the other side. This yeah. is like a divot I, in the ridge. I, I, I think when we go back up, might be our best bet of finding some loose debris. Roger. If that's okay. Yeah, Keep that'll moving. be the easiest place to sample too. Okay, perfect. Bridge Thank map. you. About the favorite critter, it's definitely the Dumbo Five octopus. Zero zero nine zero. Yeah. Thanks, Bronwyn. I would agree. Right. Definitely the Dumbo here. octopus that we saw, um, I believe that was last week. We saw three in one dive. Uh, there was a small one, a big one, and then another small one. And when I say big, I mean uh, just under three feet, or yeah, about two and a half feet. So that was absolutely my favorite, and Bronwyn's. I don't know if anybody else wants to add any other instance. Definitely mine, too. Logan's, too. Yeah, maybe second. The uh, helmet crabs. Oh yeah, the hermit crabs. Yeah. <laughs> With their anemone backpacks. Yes, and it is cool. Those are great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it, from the bathy, it kind of looked like a little bit of a knife's edge, but um, I think uh -huh. it should steepen a little and bit. Hello, forty-two North yeah, Solutions. Yeah, Thank yeah, you for like watching us in like your office. That's, that's great. Very interesting. I'm not sure what would cause that cause that morphology. I mean, I've seen some, you know, larger, blockier, cracked material. Maybe it could be carbonate, but yeah, um, I think this will put us up for a really good uh, eight to twelve watch for when Rob comes on and can uh, expand upon kind of the landscape so somebody aspects of this. Is asking what would be your dream find on this dive. Excellent question. Our dream find. I feel like each of us is, <laughs> we each want to see something different. Um, Nick, what would be your dream find? Um, my dream find. I, I would like to say, you know, like an underwater volcano that is, you know, just erupting, but I, 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 we would kind of already have an idea of, it, of where that was. Yeah. So it wouldn't really be a fine, but it would be really, really interesting to see. That uh, would be very Or it would be really close to an active uh, underwater volcano. Yeah. Steve, what would you say? Uh, dream find? Yeah. Um. I don't know about a dream find, but that sponge last night got you a little. <laughs> yeah, you're yeah, I mean, got you a little. It, uh, it, it was more so that it, it has been observed sev several times uh -huh. um, and not collected. That was kind of the most exciting yeah. part about it. Sure. Uh, I, I'm just grateful for the opportunity to be here. Yeah. Just happy to be here. <laughs> all right. Happy for uh, everything. It's all a dream. Seeing Go anything on. really, yeah, it's all a dream. <laughs> I think mine would dream when you never still, sleep. still be the sperm whale like they saw in that descent some years back. Yeah, the sperm yeah, whale cool. for sure. I would love to see something we haven't dreamed of yet. Yeah. Yeah. Giant squid. Yeah, colossal squid. Kraken. Kraken. Or like something. Netty. Even Netty. like just unimaginable. Like. Mm, true. Yeah, like so something beyond our dreams that we can't even like fathom right now. Like that'd be. So, so, so cool. So cool to see that uh, for the first time. If like the yellow brick road type uh, sighting would be absolutely amazing. Yeah. Or even, you know, just one of those vast columnar basalt fields would be really breathtaking. Sure. Whale fall would be particularly interesting because What's it's that? a setting we've never observed out here in I the know. Pacific remote islands. So yeah. it's really interesting to see how fauna would associate with a whale fall out here. It's slightly different energy inputs than the continental margin. Um, so, you know, would you have octopus, for example, or would you have um, a greater uh, echinoderm, um, asteroid sea stars, or sideroid urchins, or these kinds of things um, at these depths? It's totally unknown, so that would be pretty novel to see something like that. But 
like we said, it's it's like winning the lottery. <laughs> you have to be in the right place at the right time. And, uh, otherwise, you wouldn't really even know that it was a whale fall. Right. I'm changing my answer to barrel eye fish. Ooh, Ooh. Ron oh, I love barrel eyes. They're barrel super. Eye. Have you seen one? Their super eyes weird. look upward, and then the their head is translucent, it's so it's like an airplane. You can see right into their head to see their eyes. Yeah, those are cool. Barrel eye fish are really, oh, really yeah. awesome. Excellent. And our uh, the students from MC are making Dumbo octopuses after <laughs> they watch the live stream. So they're actually doing a craft. That's so excellent. Oh my god, amazing. Oh, that's, um, yeah, we should, uh, I wonder if we still have the old vampire toothless hats <laughs> somewhere. No way, you have hats? They were made um, by Science Friday for Cephalopod Week, which was a... <laughs> celebration of all things cephalopod. I think if you actually search for vampire squid hats, Science Friday, uh, you'll find the pattern online. Gabby, do you think we might be able them. to poke around over here if we have time? Yeah. yeah. The ship is so crafty. I definitely remember Steve wearing one of those hats. Yes. <laughs> Halloween. I can see it. Yeah. Coming down. This area over here. So one of our viewers wants to know more about bioluminescence. Are there any coral species that are bioluminescent and are we able to see any of that if we take a sample and bring it um, up onto the ship? Uh, yes, there are bioluminescent coral species. No, we've never really seen it uh, in the lab, although we tried this I have. cruise. In the lab? I've seen uh, bioluminescent zoanthids in the lab. Zoanthids, yeah. Wait, zoanthids are corals, right? Uh, kind of. They're, 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 it's a, yeah, th um, you can okay. put the lasers on it uh, to, to check the size of yeah, the rocks. Yeah, the size of that. that yeah. One? yeah. There are zoanthids that are coral-like, but traditionally they're not part oh. of the... Oh, okay, they had corals. me fooled, but they definitely lit up in the lab, and it was I mean pretty wild. Yeah, they're hexacorals in that, you know, th they belong to that group hexacorallia, but not corals in the way that they don't usually pre uh, precipitate their own skeleton. Okay, I stand corrected. I mean, it's, it, it's kind of a, Go yeah, it's a bit of a nomenclature difference. Is this what you're looking for? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, Steve, do you think that that'll be okay to fit in the box, or is it a little we too big? We can try it. Um, I could try for, I mean, maybe something cool. smaller. Smaller would be better Thanks. if you wanted to fit it in the one of the smaller bins. Yeah. Um, you could fit that in F, I think. You could try for F. Yeah, and if yeah. not, we can maybe grab something else if that's sure. okay. Sure. Or E, I think, actually. Pretty flat. Not too yeah, it's, it's kind of flat, but it, I mean, oh, well. Nick, there are a lot of rocks in those boxes. Yeah. But those rock boxes aren't full yet, though. Okay. Well, we can <laughs> fix that. I think uh, I'll pass on that one. I'm sorry. Uh, oh. it's, it does seem a little flat over here on this edge. And, uh, Get it back. Something jumping out at you. You, you had me in the first half, Nick. <laughs> It's we can. We still have time to try for another. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Let's try maybe that one or this one. Uh, not the big one behind this it. This one. Yeah. 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 That looks pretty angular. Quite. Looks like it might have broken off of here even. Yeah. That looks like or a candy corn. Or is that a sponge? That's a sponge. That's a sponge in between. Mm -hmm. Happy birthday, Dan Walsh. Thank you for watching us. And then we did have a question about those. I think those you're at the limit there. Yeah. Uh, the lasers, Sorry. they are attached to the ROV. Yes, those are not an overlay. And again, we're using those lasers to measure uh, or get a gauge of how big or small, whatever it is that we're taking a look at is. Uh, so the distance in between each laser is 10 centimeters. Thanks.
So, uh, Nick, if you look at the Hercules mesosonar, mm -hmm. you can see that we're like down in this crevice. Yeah. Uh, just like a crack in the rocks. That's. Do you okay. See that? Yeah. Yeah. That. I do see that. Yeah. That's an, an ideal spot, I would imagine. Okay. And I like that rock actually. Okay. Uh, do you think? We yeah. We'll take should. it. I think we can go into a, either small or big on the starboard side. Thank you for pointing that out. Um. Bronwyn, where do you want this to go? Yes. Uh, stand by. Um, I think let's go for E. Okay. Just Going to use sample salvo. Huh? Thanks. Yeah, 184. Oh, yeah, with the scoop, hey? Oh yeah, we'll, we'll go with that scoop. I, I think it'll go into one of the smaller compartments. Actually, I think okay. it's small enough. That, uh, okay, if that we're going for small, we let's only have to worry about top and bottom rock. Let's go for um, B or C. Okay. Science, is there anything else you're going to want to do here? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Let let hedging. Run out, <laughs> I, am, uh, I am evaluating those. Uh, all right, so that went into Lovely. C. And that was what sample? 184. 184, I think. Uh, I'm looking at actually this thing right here. Uh, maybe doing a small snip. Okay. Since we're stopped. We sure are. Um, <laughs> let me get the that sample locked. Um, sure. But no rush, we're at the image there. one. Okay, uh, we don't have forever here because we may get pulled off, but uh, right. where are you looking? Let's start with the zoom here and then okay. we'll go from there. Oh, I see this little one. Yeah, it's okay. on the side of the rock there. Go for zoom. Any more? You can push in more. Uh, okay. I am not going to... Go for a collection. Okay, there. go away. That's a primnoid. Is that that same double stock one that we sampled a while back, a couple dives ago? The same uh, coral? Yeah, that like is paired into two it long could be. branches. It's, it's really tough to tell. That's what I was trying to figure out if it was that same one or if it was a different one. Um, that's why it's it's very tough to tell in these circumstances. If we had unlimited capacity, it would be really nice to sample like one of everything that we see just to confirm and look at the natural variability, but I don't think I've ever been on a cruise where that's been possible. Short of maybe using like a, a dredge or a trawl, but then you don't get the in situ um, context of Nick, your keep sample. your eyes on the Herc Mezzo as we go through here, because you're not going to be able to see in the Herc video as well as you can see in the Herc Mezzo. It's pretty cool terrain. No, Nick. Yeah, he no, took, Nick, he no took rocks. His rocks and, and left, so. Nick has left the building temporarily. Nick said that, like, oh, <laughs> Nick's gone. <laughs> Something about no, Nick, no rocks. why can't we sample more rocks or something <laughs> on the way out? <laughs> you snooze, you lose, Nick. We joke back here. We have fun. <laughs> this um. is interesting. This doesn't. Th this doesn't strike me as uh, much of a volcanic context. Really, this looks more like what you would see at a, you know, a carbonate reef environment. Oh, 
Um, is it possible to get those overhead lights off? Oh, down lights, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, yes. I'm just gonna... If you have a moment, uh, though, whenever, uh, can we zoom on these two? Swat lobsters on the sponge. Okay, uh, go for zoom. They might be on the back side oh, when okay. I need to pirouette around. getting a question about uh, do we take ships on here? The answer is yes. Uh, so again, thank you so much for joining us and watching. Um, we have these dives um, that are hours and hours on end. So again, this current dive that we are uh, that we are in is about 20 hours long. So we take four hour shifts. So this is the four to eight crew, and then after is gonna be eight to 12, after that it's 12 to four. But I believe this dive is concluding at 12. All right. 2400. Twi I think we're good. Yeah. Okay, go on. 2400 or 12? 12, 12, 12 a.m., uh, right? Isn't that 2400? Or is that zero, zero, zero on a military time? 12, 12 a.m. p.m. So 2,400 is, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we started our watch when we started the dive, which means we get three watches on this one dive, but that's not always the case, depending on what time the dive starts. Two watches. Yeah. Right? Yeah, didn't we start the dive at 4 p.m. yesterday? Yeah, so, but then we'll go till Aren't we going till I think it's only midnight 20 hours, tonight? so we'll go till noon today. Yeah, we're yeah. going till noon. So 1,200. Yeah, the, other ah. 1200. the other 12. Right? Yeah. Yep. Other 12. Okay. Was that, a, was that a change in the plan? I thought it was a 2,400 recovery. I think that was the previous dive. I think all of our dives are running together in our minds. It's just a um, constant dive. Yeah. We just go up and down. We just go up and down, yes. 20 hours plus, uh, uh, plus 4 p.m. 1,600 yesterday is 12 o'clock noon. The board of lies has lied again. Oh, has the board changed? I don't know. I, I don't know anymore. It's a picture of the mental board I, I have. It might might be the previous dive all blending together. The last dive's recovery was 2,400. Right. Hmm, that changes my plans for the day. <laughs> uh -oh. That was a good dive. <laughs> okay, so we've had a pilot swap in the front row. Uh, oh, we have a deck chief entering the van. Hopefully it's for a social visit. <laughs> <laughs> He's smiling on his face, so. Oh. Oh. <laughs> All right, well, um. Snugs, snugs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, science, anything else you want to do here? Uh, we're good. We're good. Okay. We will keep moving then if ROV is good to you. ROV says thumbs up. Great. Uh, we'll keep on 090. Bridge now. Uh, five zero meters, zero nine zero. Nick, we have a question, a rock question from the <laughs> crafty students in North Carolina. They want to know what is the oldest rock that we have ever recorded from the ocean? Uh, oceanic crust can get up to about 180 million years old. Um, some of these hotspot volcanoes are obviously younger since they're recorded within the oceanic crust. Um, the Hawaiian Emperor uh, chain goes, I think, back to 90 million years. And some of these seamounts that we're exploring now are theorized to be uh, 70 to 80 million years and possibly uh, some even older in the 100 million year age. 
So some really old rocks. And you know, those rocks we cut open from the last dive yeah. uh, with those really thick ferromanganese crusts, those have the potential to be very, very old seamounts. Very cool. Yeah. So speaking of seamounts, what is a seamount and why are we exploring seamounts instead of the ocean floor? Yeah, so... Uh, zoom on that. Yeah. Seamounts are essentially under uh, water volcanoes uh, that are um, formed within plate boundaries uh, as opposed to the volcanoes you'll typically see at uh, divergent or convergent uh, plate boundaries. Um, they're really nice um, reference frames for um, the movement of lithospheric or, con or uh, you know, oceanic plates. Uh, the plates themselves, uh, the ocean basins themselves, rather, uh, can be kind of tricky to date. Um, usually we kind of classify them in mag uh, in um, using right. magnetic lineations. Uh, so basically we record um, pole, polar uh, reversals, uh, which happen uh, you know, on the order of millions of years to longer. Uh, and uh, one of the problems we have with plate tectonic uh, reconstructions is an, a time, geologic time period called the Cretaceous Supercron from about 70 to 120 million years ago where uh, there was no magnetic shift, so we don't really know what was going on in the ocean basins at that time. And dating these seamounts is essential to uh, to to uh, data Thank points you. in that in that range. Boom. That was an answer, Nick. That was great. <laughs> Thank you. As always. As always. Then come wide, please. I love the purple crinoids. An answer to the uh, question about favorite animals like two hours ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, yeah, so just to clarify, we got chat a little confused. So yeah, the dive is expected to be ending at 1200 um, Hawaiian Standard Time, so noon, not 2400, not midnight. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> no, you're good. Sorry. It happens. Go for zoom, please. Oh, nice. This is uh, a colony of Chrysogorgia. We've seen this one um, through most of the dive. <laughs> Has one resident home, Squat Lobster. Squat Lobster. We're doing squat counts. I think we were. We were, but we're not time. on this. Not on this shift. <laughs> Too much other things <laughs> going on. Too much. Bronwyn said no. Um, yeah, so that is a squat lobster, and oftentimes, or sometimes, we can see them uh, hanging out in or around coral and sponges. They are what's known as associates. So, in addition to squat lobsters, there are also uh, different types of sea stars, crinoids, uh, worms that may or, or may not be predatory and actually maybe potentially causing damage to the coral or sponge, but um, oftentimes the associates are uh, kind of a neutral presence or even slightly maybe beneficial to the coral that they are um, hanging out on. But they are not, in fact, lobsters more closely related to hermit crabs. So they're not, they're not like small, they're not true lobsters. Yeah, they're not small lobsters that are going to get much bigger. Like that, that's that's it. They're more like a crab size, hermit crab size. Go for zoom. Hello to our viewer from Switzerland.